Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hope you're doing okay. Uh, so I just noticed in the schedule that there has been a bunch of talks on serverless already today. So I hope what they say is true, that they save the best for last, right? Um, so for the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about how serverless is actually changing the cloud as we know it. And um, well, let's do a quick in personal introduction first. So uh, my name is Bernard Mann. I'm from the Netherlands. I work for a company called Luminous. And uh, my background has been in Java for the past 23 years or so, which has been more than half of my life. And um, I go to lots of conferences to listen to great stories of other people and also do a lot of conference talks myself. So today, we're going to talk about serverless. And I'd like to introduce the subject uh, with this little graph over here. So if you look from the left to the right-hand side, you see that it was not that long ago when, when, we were when we were developing software, we were actually deploying it on real physical machines. And these physical machines, they were out there somewhere, either in the basement of the company that we were working for, or they were maybe underneath our desk, right? So I think it was about 10, 15 years ago when it was really, well, common practice. So about 10 to 12 years ago, this whole trend of virtualization really took off. So virtualization at first meant that we were just buying bigger boxes of hardware, and then we emulated multiple virtual computers on top of one physical box. And that took off for a while and got better and better. And then at some point, we decided that virtualization by itself was not enough. So we basically moved our virtual computers to the other end of the internet, to, well, somebody else's basement maybe, and we called that cloud compute, right? So just somebody else's computer at the other end of the internet. And then, like a few years ago, this whole trend of containers really took off. And containers is, well, you can think of it as another, you know, a higher layer of abstraction when it comes to virtualization, right? And then some people think that containers are still the pinnacle of virtualization, but nowadays we have serverless, and as you'll see in this graph, it's an even higher level of virtualizing uh, computers and how we deal with it. So the, the first question to ask is, why do we need something new? Why do we need, need this new paradigm of virtualization? And why do we need this new paradigm of virtual compute? Well, the reason for this is that so far, I think that the cloud has been a little bit disappointing. So the cloud was just about you know, virtualizing computers, virtualizing infrastructure, and it wasn't any sexier than that. Well, maybe with platforms as a service, you, well, you ran on somebody else's web server, but that was about it, right? So the cloud isn't really delivering on its disruptive promise just yet. Then again, even with the cloud and all of these virtualization hypes that are um, going on, we are still thinking in terms of computers or servers. And this is actually a very strange phenomena because in some way you can maybe compare a computer or a server to a pet, right? It's just like, well, you give it a name, you take care of it, right? You feed it something and well, if it goes belly up, you are really upset, right? So in, so in some ways, you can compare a computer to a pet. But in essence, we shouldn't think in this old-fashioned way of dealing with computers or service. We should deal with what comes out of these things that we call computers, which is what they produce. In this case, it's compute. Just like with cattle, uh, let's take a look at the cows, for example. So cows produce either milk or meat, right? And we are interested in what they produce probably not so much in the, in, the, in the individual animal, maybe unless you're the farmer, right? So if one animal under delivers, you would just replace it with something else. And we should think about computers the same way. So we should think about this whole big bunch of computers producing something that we call compute, and we should try and leverage on compute instead of thinking in, indiv in individual machines. Now, if we go back to this story about the cloud, when the cloud launched originally, it had this promise of pay-as-you-go, or pay-go, as you can see on the slide. Right? And pay-as-you-go means that we only pay for things when we are actually using them. And if we use more, we pay more. So if we look back at the past 10 years of cloud computer or so, right, then it turned out that we were not only paying for when we were using stuff, but we were also paying when we are not using stuff. So a lot of the computers that we have running in the cloud, even when they're idle, or when they're in some sort of standby or backup mode, we are still paying for them. 
so I made up the second uh, acronym myself, which is pay as you go and also as you don't go, which I find pretty convincing uh, acronym, right? Uh, but this is true about the cloud these days, and so it's it's a little bit underwhelming, right? So then at some point, I think it was by the end of 2014, Werner Vogels, the uh, CTO of AWS, came up with this quote. And he said, no server is easier to manage than no server at all. And this is absolutely true. So if we can take this idea of the server out of the equation, right, then as developers, we can just concentrate on writing cool things, on, on writing functional pieces of code, instead of managing servers and applying patches to servers. Right? So let's talk about the name of this thing. Right? They call it serverless. And it's a funny name, right? Because it mostly describes what it's not. And if you think back a little, then we have similar hypes. We have, for example, the hype of NoSQL, right? Where we have a bunch of completely different databases, and all that they have in common is that they don't have a structured query language. Right? So that's a funny name too. So somehow we're into the funny names these days. So with serverless, we are well not talking about servers. But you know, a little spoiler alert here, there are still servers involved, but as programmers, we don't get to deal with them. So serverless's name is, is also known by different names. So some people call it function as a service, or FAS, or if you, if you read stuff by, by analyst firms like Gartner, they talk about function PaaS because they say, well, it's some sort of a highly specialized form of a platform as a service. So we call it a function platform as a service. And then there's other people which refer to it as backend as a service, right? And I find this a really funny name because it could be my dirty mind, but you know, when I think about backends as a service, I have these kind of things in mind. This works great at parties though, because I don't know if you recognize this situation, but you know, when I go to like a birthday party or so, and people ask me, so what do you do for a living? And I tell them, well, I do something with IT. Then I get to answer this crazy question about fixing their Windows 95 computers for the, for the rest of the night, right? Do you, do you get the situation right? You're probably in the same situation, right? So nowadays, I don't say I'm in IT anymore. I say, well, I'm into backend as a service, and then they just avoid you for the rest of the night. So that's actually pretty good. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so with every you know, technological hype these days that takes itself seriously, there is this thing called the serverless manifesto. So you got to have a manifesto these uh, days, otherwise you're not like a serious uh, trend or hype. So let, let, me quick you, uh, well, let me run you quickly through this manifesto. So first bullet is that functions are now the unit of deployment and scaling. So compared to where we come from, we are used to dealing with applications, right? So we write this thing called an application, and that's what we deploy. So with FAS, or functions as a service, or with serverless, we now deploy functions. And yes, a function is exactly what you think it is. It is like uh, something which takes some arguments, then does something interesting with it, and then produces some output, right? So that's a function. So somehow you create the function, you put it into the cloud somewhere, and then you define something which makes that function run. So they're, they're both the unit of deployment, also the unit of scaling, meaning that for every user that comes in, the cloud provider will create an instance of that function, and that user will run that particular instance. So if there's two users coming in, you have two instances. If there's like a million users coming in, you have a million instances of, of your function, right? So it's the same unit of deployment and also the same unit of scaling. From a programmer's perspective, there are no real machines, no virtual machines, no containers, or whatever resembles a computer or a server are visible in the programming model, right? So we are not dealing with managing the server anymore. We're just dealing with writing the function and then deploying it. If we need something like persistent storage or permanent storage, then functions are inherently a stateless model, right? So if there's something that we should keep after the function runs, we need to put it into a cache or a database or something similar, right? But we can't keep it into the function framework somehow. Functions are stateless. Coming back to the first bullet, functions scale per request. And the cool thing about this is that, in theory, we now have infinite scalability. Because for every user coming in, a new instance will be created. And as you know, in the cloud, computers virtually, well, it's all over the place and there's no end to it, right? It's infinite compute that we have in the, in the cloud. So, well, theoretically speaking, it is infinitely scalable. The cool thing, if you think about this, is that we can now no longer over or under provision. And that is an interesting thing, because 
uh, when we are running, say, a web shop or something, then when we provision the shop to run on a bunch of web servers, we need to think about peak loads. Because every once or twice per year, there is this really big incoming load, this really, you know, this big peak of users because we run some promotion or we have some campaign or, the, or it's almost Christmas, right? And, and we need a provision for that to be able to handle the peak load. And that means that we uh, mostly have like a whole bunch of web servers and computers out there which do nothing for most of the year and only for once, you know, once or twice a year, they actually do something for their money. But we are paying for all of this idle capacity for, um, uh, well, throughout the year. So we are paying for a lot of stuff that we don't use. Now with functions, we don't have this problem anymore. We can never under or over provision because our function is just out there. If nobody triggers it, then there will be no servers running our code and we will pay for nothing. If there's a lot of users coming in at once, then it's up to the cloud provider or the man behind the curtain, if you will, to scale up enough compute resources to be able to deal with running all the functions, right? So we get load balancing out of the box. We get scaling out of the box. So, well, I already mentioned this, we never pay for idle because if our function is not running, then we're not paying for it. It gets even better. Because we scale per instance, we also have implicit fault tolerance. Right? Because if one function instance is running and it experiences some hardware or software failure underneath, then the next user that issues like a, um, a trigger that will eventually trigger our, our function will get a new instance on a new piece of compute. So the cloud provider is, is also taking care of fault tolerancy for us. So we don't have to run multiple instances of our function in order to you know, a, a deal with a, a fault tolerancy. Right, so both fault tolerancy, load balancing, and scaling is something that we get out of the box. Then it's bring your own code, and this usually means you're just writing functions. So you take whatever language that you like, you write a function implementation in it, you deploy it into the cloud, and then you hook it up to some trigger. Right, and well, depending on your cloud provider, it depends on what uh, runtime and languages they support. But you know, with some imp implementations, you can even bring your own runtime, so then you can literally run it in any language and on any framework that you like. And finally, metrics and logging are a universal right. And this is interesting because if we have many function instances running all over the place, then you want to keep track of your metrics. You want to know what is running when, uh, how much time does it take. Uh, are there any errors uh, and whatever, right? So you want to keep an oversight of what is going on. So this is what metrics form. And logging at, at the same time are, are, are also important because if we have many instances running on whatever service that we can't access, right, how do we get to the logs? So the cloud provider does some log aggregation for us and provides us the log, the log output of all our function instances in a centralized way. So we have easy access to log, and we can uh, um, start debugging our function if something is wrong. All right, so just to sum it up, this leads to a number of really interesting benefits, right? So we no longer have any servers to install, to set up, to patch, to maintain, whatever. So we are not dealing with servers anymore. We only pay for when stuff actually runs, right? We never pay for idle, not if it's in cold standby, not if it's in hot standby, never. <coughs> And we get automatic scaling and even automatic failover just for free. It comes out of the box with the model in how this works. So in other words, right, we are no, dealing, no longer dealing with running application servers anymore or with running applications inside application servers, and we're not even dealing with containers anymore. So sorry for little Will over there, right, but we don't care. So the cloud provider could still be running containers underneath, Right? That's up to the cloud provider, but as function developers, we will never actually get to touch those containers. We never see them. All right, so far sounds like a pretty decent technology, right? It's cats riding unicorns, so can't get any better than that. So let's take a better look. So first off, I just listed the, well, big four cloud providers out there and what they have to offer. If you look at this little timeline, uh, which I crafted here, you can see that Amazon really started this hype back in 2014 with the release of AWS Lambda. And, you know, I think for the first year or so, that was pretty much in beta. But especially over the last two years, we see lots of pickup on, uh, on Lambdas and functions in, in general at other cloud providers too. As you can see, the other big cloud providers 
like IBM, uh, Microsoft, Google, they all jumped on the serverless bandwagon and the function bandwagon uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, right? And there's many more imp implementations besides these big four, uh, but I couldn't list them all. So for the remainder of this talk, I just pick one. So I'll pick AWS Lambda to show you some specifics, and I'll talk a little bit about some other implementations out there if you like the one by Google or the one by IBM more, right? I'll refer to those implementations as well. So like I said, this was introduced back in November 2014. So, if, well, there's, uh, there, there's already a couple years of uh, mileage in here. And it's part of the many offerings that Amazon has. So it's just one of their compute types uh, that they offer. And they call it like an event-driven serverless compute platform. So it runs code in response to something that happens, like an event or a trigger that you can set. So AWS offers you support for a number of languages. So we have Python and Node.js. We have C Sharp, Java 8, and a few months ago also Go support was announced. So you pick any of these, well, I only see one real language in this list, obviously, uh, but um, you, you just pick any of these, write a function implementation, and off you go. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna pick um, Java, of course. So let's, create, let's start by creating a new project. So I'm uh, using Eclipse here because it has a really nice AWS plugin. If you prefer uh, IntelliJ or some other IDE, there is an excellent uh, CLI, uh, which you can integrate with from your IDE if you want to use another IDE. But um, with the AWS plugin for um, uh, Lambda, it's really easy to create this AWS Lambda Java project. So you just uh, give it a name. So let's call it uh, DevOps PL. And I just have to set, I, I will create a function, and I just have to set the input type, which I will just set to an object for now, because just plain and simple impl implementation. It will generate the project and a little bit of code, and then I can start writing my function implementation. Now, as you can tell from this code, which is not much, it is just a single class containing one uh, method, in this case, this, so our function, which is called handle request. And handle request gets an object as input, and it returns a string in this case. And obviously I can just uh, alter this if I want. So in this case, I'm gonna write a very simple um, hello world implementation. So I'm just gonna say uh, hello DevOps. All right, I can just save this. And then, um, uh, there we go. I can immediately uh, go to my uh, test source tree over here, and it has generated a very simple uh, test harness for me, so I can quickly start experimenting with my one function, because this is easy to unit test, right? It's just a, a single function, single method. So I just set the input over here, and then I can write a very simple test, and see if that works. So let's quickly run the test, run as JUnit test, and we get a green bar. So because functions are just a tiny thing, which is easy to unit test, right? You get the unit testing support in here as well. So now I just ran it, and apparently it works. But running this on my laptop is not so much fun as running it in the cloud, obviously. So let's get rid of the test over here, and let's deploy this function into the cloud. So for this, I use the plugin again. So I go to the plugin, and I say, upload this function to AWS Lambda. And now I have to set the right reason, so uh, this is the right region. So I'm going to deploy it in uh, EU Ireland. This is where most of my stuff is located, and I'll just call it uh, my uh, DevOps function. Go to the next, give it a meaningful description, right? And then I can need to just give it some basic execution rights, so it can can run the function, it can access uh, the uh, logging, and, and nothing more here. And then I have to select a so-called S3 bucket, and this is where I will upload my function code. So basically what the wizard will do, it will create a zip file containing my class and supporting libraries, if I have them, and it will upload that into an S3 bucket, and that, that's where it will just keep the zip file. And that is what Amazon will use whenever somebody triggers my function later on to get the code from uh, um, and get it running. So this is where I set the bucket, and then finally I have to do a couple settings, I have to tune the memory and some timeout. And this is where you probably say, wait a minute. So there's no servers in this model, so why do I have to tune memory setting? Well, basically you're not tuning memory here so much, you're tuning your credit card here, right? So in this case, it's hello world, so 128 megabytes should probably be okay for Java, right? 
and then timeout for hello world, well, one second. And this is once again a limit on your credit card because functions are metered per 100 milliseconds. So you basically set like a cutoff timeout here. So if it runs for longer than one second, Amazon will just kill my instance, right? And I will be billed for one second uh, uh, max. And so uh, you, you will be billed per 100 milliseconds and also for the amount of memory that you use. So if you use more memory, then the bill will get a little bit higher. So now I'm done setting this thing up. Press finish here. It will then create this zip file and will then upload it into the cloud. And you know, if the demo gods are with me, and apparently they are, then it will enter the cloud. And now it's just lying there. And now I will use the same plugin to trigger that function. So I will go to the plugin again and I will, I will say, um, run this function on AWS Lambda, so I can set some input. So let's uh, say that looks Poland, right? And then press invoke, and then hopefully we get some results back. And uh, yes, we do. So I get the output back, hello DevOx, and then I get some metrics and some logging back. So here you see the input DevOx Poland. We get some request ID apparently. Uh, which is uh, handy for correlation. And then we get some duration. So apparently it took a little over 300 milliseconds. And as you can see, we will be built for 400 milliseconds because it rounds it up to the next 100 milliseconds. And then memory size was set to 128 megabyte, but I only used 51, right? So I can tune it down a little bit uh, more if I want to. Um, but although the minimum amount for Java is 128, so I can't tune it uh, uh, down, right? But let's see what happens when I run this again. So, oops, uh, run the function. Let's give it the same input, invoke it again. Now you see it only took 11 milliseconds. So apparently it gets faster if you run it again. I can do it again and eventually it will run in under one millisecond. So um, how come? Well, the interesting thing is that whenever somebody first uh, fires a request to this service, Amazon needs to spin up something like a server or a container or something in which it loads the function, but not only the function, it also needs to bootstrap the JVM, load all of the classes, and especially if you use frameworks, that could take a while, right? And uh, so you pay a little penalty for writing this in Java because it needs to boot up the JVM and load all the classes. So apparently it keeps the function hot because when I run it again, I do not pay the penalty of firing up the JVM again. And so after say one or two or three invocations, right, I get the maximum performance out of this. So keeping the Java function hot is actually uh, a best practice if you want to have maximum performance, right? So you don't pay this penalty every time. Now, from my own experiments, and from uh, uh, I found that Amazon is keeping your Java functions hot for about 40, 45 minutes currently, right? So what you can do is write some trigger that you know test your function every 30 or 35 minutes. So you make sure to keep the function hot, so you not pay the penalty for firing up the JVM all the time. If you choose another language like uh, JavaScript or uh, Python for that matter, it's interpreted on the go, so you don't have this penalty of firing up the JVM. So depending on your use case, uh, it might make sense to run it into another language uh, instead of Java, right? But uh, once the function is hot, you get decent performance out of it. So let's switch to the other end of the internet. Let's switch to um, uh, Amazon's view on Lambda, right? So this is the uh, AWS Lambda console. As you can see, I have a bunch of functions in there. And one of them is my DevOx function, which I just created. And here you can see it has access to the logs. And if I scroll down, we can also find our configuration. So you see here's my timeout, here's the uh, memory, here's my uh, description and, and everything, right? And if I scroll up again, I can go to the monitoring tab. I can get some basic metrics of my function. So I can see how much time uh, I've, in, uh, I've invoked it, what the duration was, et cetera, et cetera, if there were any errors. Um, and so forth. And I can jump to the logs, which will bring me to the aggregated logs in something which is called CloudWatch. And here you, you basically see the same output as I've shown you before in, uh, uh, in the Eclipse console. So you can see I ran it two times uh, with the same input, and you see the metrics uh, in here, so the amount of milliseconds, etc. Right? All right, so this is just Lambda 101. So let's get back to slides for a little bit. So, like I mentioned before, Amazon is calling this an event-driven platform. So Lambda's run in response to something, right? So something happens and that will trigger the Lambda. 
So within Amazon and also within Microsoft and Google's implementations of this, there are many event sources which could trigger Lambda functions. So if you're familiar with Amazon's terminology, you would probably recognize some of these. If you're not, I tried to translate them for you. So basically, you can have a lot of event sources, like incoming HTTP requests or REST calls can be directed to trigger a Lambda function. Um, another cool thing is you can have it as a response on certain CRUD events on your data store. So whenever somebody inserts a new file into a data store, that could trigger a Lambda. Whenever somebody deletes a file or updates a file in a data store, that could trigger a Lambda. They can take that file or the metadata about that file as input and do something interesting with it. You can also make it messaging based. So you can send an event either in memory or via message queuing, or you can even send it an email and you can have a Lambda responding to that email or that in memory message or that uh, message queuing message. You can also hook it up to lock and stream processing, even to real time processing, right? So you, if you have like a huge incoming amount of data, then you can set triggers on that data. So whenever it finds something interesting, it can take that little piece of data out of the stream and trigger a Lambda with that piece of data as input, right? So it's, if you want to do sentiment analysis on how DevOx Poland is doing, right? You just hook it up to the Twitter firehose, you read all the incoming tweets, and whenever you find uh, something with the, hef the, the hashtag uh, DevOx Poland, then you take that particular tweet and you give it to a Lambda function to do like sentiment analysis and figure out whether somebody is happy or not about this conference. You can hook it up to well, a whole bunch of other services that have to do with configuration management, and uh, you can hook it up to Amazon source control and all of the other services that they have uh, for developers. And uh, last but not least, you can hook it up to their voice and text services. And this is why I brought the Amazon Alexa device. So if we have time later on, I can do a demo with that too. All right, now let's take a step back and let's see if this thing called serverless could eventually replace what we have building for the last couple of years, right? So what have we been building? Well, probably web applications of some sort. And if you look at what a given web application looks like, then we have something like this. We have a client in the, in the form of a browser. Then we have some sort of a server-side part, the web application itself, which either emits HTML back to the browser or you know, just a bunch of REST calls in an API. And then we have a database to keep our state. Right? So the question is, can we completely replace this model with a serverless implementation of this? And the answer obviously is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. So the model looks a little bit different, a little bit more complicated, if you will. And so let me talk you through this. So first problem that we have to solve when we want to do a serverless implementation of web applications is we need to figure a way of getting static data into the browser, right? Because the browser needs to load some HTML in order to interact with our application. So for this, we can use something like a CDN, a content delivery network. So if you have a bunch of static compiled files, like maybe some HTML, JavaScript, CSS, right, with some Angular or whatever popular framework of the day in it, right, then we just dump those into a CDN or into an S3 bucket within Amazon, and we mark the bucket as, as hosting a public website, and then we can put a DNS entry on it, and people can access uh, that thing as were it a website. Right? So you just download the static content from the CDN or the S3 bucket. And now we have some HTML which we can render in our browser. The next step is we need to have some form of an authentication and authorization services. Well, and lucky for us, there's many of third-party authentication services out there on, on the Internet. So you probably integrate with something using OAuth or, or a similar mechanism uh, in order uh, to have like a third party help you with auth authentication. And with a lot of them, you can hook it up to, you know, on-premise um, uh, security systems, if you like. Then we need to have some uh, dynamic data in the client. So let's, let's say if you're building a shopping site, then we need to get the catalog of books so people can browse the books and then they can start ordering. So in order to get dynamic data into the browser, we can just use one of the many databases which are nowadays offered by cloud providers. And most of these databases these days offer the option to mark a catalog as read-only and expose it to the outside world directly using REST or similar mechanisms. So you just dump read-only product data in a database and you just immediately expose that to the internet. There's no harm in doing that because now your client running Angular or whatever framework can easily connect to those REST services and download the data, right? So now we have a way of providing the data to our clients. 
And then the user can start browsing. And eventually, while he's browsing, browsing to all of the you know, listing and detail pages, he can start ordering. And we can make, recommenda we can make recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. So eventually, handling this session flow of pages, which we used to do on the server, can now be done in the client, because frameworks like Angular and React and, and everything uh, runs this MVC kind of stuff on the client these days anyway. Then, if you want to integrate with functionality which does run on the backend, and this is where functions come in, right? we need something which we call an API gateway these days. And an API gateway on the left-hand side exposes APIs, like maybe uh, REST APIs. Right? So from the, our client's perspective, once again, we can easily integrate with those REST APIs. We can version them, we can do A-B testing with them, uh, we can throttle them, whatever. That's functionality that the API uh, gateway provides. And on the right-hand side, it connects an incoming call to a function on the right-hand side. So in this case, could be the search function, which does some you know, magic search thing, maybe based on the same product catalog, but somehow we chose to keep it on the server. So a user can do a get call or a post call to the API gateway, which will then trigger our search function, which does its magic, and then return it through the API gateway back to the client. Same thing for purchase functionality, which is something you obviously want to keep on the server because it, you know, it includes some payment uh, stuff, etc. And then finally, if an order comes out of this, we just store it into a database on the back end as well. Now, if you think about both our functions and all of the middleware services that I have been talking about, for none of these services, we are actually caring about installing the server, installing the middleware, applying patches to that middleware, or taking care of that middleware at all. Not the databases, not the API gateway, not the CDN. We just put our stuff there. So thinking about this, the, the big picture, this is an entirely serverless way of building web applications. right? So yes, it can be done. On the same note, I would also say, just because you can, might not always be the right reason. right? So don't go back to work tomorrow or next week and replace all of your web applications with serverless uh, implementations. Well, okay, it will probably be cool for a little while, but this is probably not the right tool to just replace everything because this is just new or just because you can, right? That's not always the right reason. So let's look at some better scenarios. Let's look at, at some specific scenarios where serverless is a really interesting tool to have in your toolbox. And one of them is obviously event-based processing because processing whenever something interesting happens is exactly what this whole approach was invented for. So you probably want to respond to certain specific incoming data, such as somebody inserting something into a database or something coming out of a stream of data, etc. So let's look at the following scenario. So here we have an application. Could be like an uh, app on your phone or tablet. Could be like a web application. And then this application, before you can even use the real service of this application, you have to sign up and create a profile. And part of creating this profile is filling out lots of fields with your personal data. And then at some point, you also have to select an image of yourself, like an avatar, right? Now, these days, people just take their phones, right? Take a picture of themselves and then upload like a 10 megabyte a picture. Now, 10 megabyte pictures are probably not really good for avatars because they you know, take a lot of time to download. So this is typically something you want to do something about. So inside our app or our web application, we have this upload form where we can upload this you know, huge image. We put it into an S3 bucket. And then on the bucket, we, we set a trigger to trigger a Lambda function. Then the Lambda function will convert our 10 megabyte image into like a really small thumbnail, which is you know, uh, quick and easy to download and work with from then on. Right? So this is like a typical scenario. So why is this a good scenario? Well, imagine you create this stuff as part of your normal web application and your startup. And at some point, people pick up on your service and your service gets really popular. So you have a lot of signups. You have maybe dozens of signups per second, or maybe even more if you, go really, if you really go viral. Then this will create a lot of load on your web application. So you need to scale for it. And you are scaling just because you need to scale for signups. But signups may be over the next day, or just uh, only a few of them. And then like two weeks later, or a month later, when you get rediscovered, you see massive amount of incoming signups again. 
So this is hard to scale. And because it is hard to scale, and with serverless we get scaling out of the box, right? This is something that you can just take out of a regular web application and deploy it as a standalone solution. So what does this look like in practice? So I have something like this set up. I have a Lambda function over here, which is called thumbnail creator Lambda. And what this does, it listens to incoming S3 events. It's a little bit hard to read, but it says there's an S3 bucket over here, which is called incoming files for Lambda. And whenever somebody creates an object inside of this bucket, it will trigger this function. And then it does what it says, so it takes the incoming image, converts it into a thumbnail, and then places it into another S3 bucket. So if I show you the view that the S3 management console gives me, I have a bunch of buckets in here, and one of them is the incoming files for Lambda bucket. And as you can see, I have nothing up my sleeve, so it's completely empty. Right? I go back to root level, and I have a second uh, bucket, which is called processed image thumbnails, which is also empty. Okay. Go back again, go to my incoming files, and now I'll just upload an image. So let's add a file over here, go to my desktop. Let's take an image like this. Right, so this is like a 2,000 by 2,000 pixels uh, image. I just take that as my avatar, so I open it. It's way too big for, for my profile, so I upload it. And then you see it's there. And so when the uh, Lambda is done, it will eventually remove the incoming image because it's just eating up storage, and you have to pay for storage in the cloud, so you don't need it anymore. Now the cloud is eventually consistent, so I have to... Okay, so it's, it's gone, right? Now we go back to the other bucket, the target bucket, and that one is empty too, but once again, if I refresh it, you can see that there's now like a Hulk thumbnail over here, and if I open this up, and I actually open it, you see that I've now turned it into a 100 by 100 pixel thumbnail. So this is an ideal scenario for using lambdas. Okay, just skills per request. So if I have one sign up, I just pay for the few hundred milliseconds for the one uh, conversion. If I have like 100 sign ups uh, at the same time, then it will just spin up 100 instances of my uh, thumbnail creator and it will uh, do 100 conversions at the same time. So it automatically scales and I only pay for what I use. So this is a really good scenario for harnessing the power of lambdas. Now, some of you might say, I've seen this before. You know, somebody puts something in a table and then something happens. And we call that database triggers and that didn't end too well. Okay, because we had triggers, triggering, triggers, triggering, triggers, triggering, triggers, etc. And then nobody know how it worked anymore. So yeah, with Lambda, you can have the same problem, right? So if you have Lambdas all over the place, just triggering stuff, then this will grow into some really hairy implementation uh, really quickly. So at some point, it really depends on your use case whether you actually benefit from this approach. But for this simple scenario that I just showed you, it works out really, really well. So let me give you another example where this really works out well. So let's get back to the whole backend as a service thing, right? So once again, we have another heavily used backend over here. And in this case, I want to build something which is basically a backend function for mobile apps. So if you're like a mobile app developer, then um, you're probably really good at writing, you know, iOS applications or Android applications, and you concentrate work on your front end, right? So on the app itself. But somehow, some functionality needs to happen on the back end. And up until now, that probably meant that you had to go to Heroku or Google App Engine or some other PaaS platform. You had to set up a web server, you had to maintain that web server and patch it. You had to think about how many web servers that you actually needed. Set up, well, maybe your own API gateway and a whole bunch of functionality. And it, you know, it just takes your focus away, right? You're dealing with all kind of infrastructure and all that you want is some functionality in the back end that is just, you know, adding to the functionality which is in your front end, which is where the money comes from. So backend as a service is a really interesting scenario for Lambdas. Because now, either if you have like a mobile application or if you have a web application, right, you can have it interact with something like the API gateway. And that API gateway can respond to incoming requests, map it to a Lambda function, and that Lambda function can then put something in a database or interact with some other cloud-provided uh, infrastructure. So I have a, an example of this too, and in the process of demoing you this, you might even learn a few Dutch words, because this example is in Dutch. 
So this is, you know, this is like a killer app. I'm about to release this, and this solves a really important problem. Because in the Netherlands, all developers, or mostly all developers, get like this company car. And company cars are really cool for the first couple months. And then after a few months, you already start thinking about your next company car. Right? You recognize this problem in Poland too? No. Okay, maybe not. Well, in Netherlands, we this is like a really big problem. So company cars, well, you they get issued to you at a certain date. So mine got issued to my to, to me like a few months ago. And then these company cars, they either the contract for these company cars have a runtime of say four years or 48 months in this case. So you either run it for 48 months or you run the car until you reach a certain mileage. So in this case, uh, it's either 48 months or till I hit like 140k kilometers. So now, if I put in this data, I can give in my current mileage. So let's say I have driven, let's say, 9,000 kilometers with this car already. And then I can calculate whether I will hit the 48 months or whether I will hit the max amount of mileage first so I can already start thinking about new car. Right, so this is what it does. But this is just basically front end. So it sends a request to the API gateway, which will then get picked up by a Lambda, which will then return me the answer. And you can see I'm probably not a uh, really good front end developer, right? Um, but there's, there's some results, so this is en encouraging. So it lists some you know, basic details. Your contract starts February 14, 2018. It runs till 40 mo 48 months later. And then the current date is June 20. You're already 9% into your contract. Um, uh, if you want to return the car before the end of contract, you need to drive at least 95 kilometers per day. And so far, you've driven 9,000, so you only did 71 on average per day, which is not enough, right? So I need to step up my game. I need to fly less and drive more in this case. And that will get me a new car before the end of contract. Right. So that's how we do it. All right, now let's, let's take a look at the Lambda side of things. So let's go back to the management console. Let's go back to my list of functions. I have this Loptide calculator Lambda over here, which, as you can see, is hooked up to the API gateway um, as the trigger for this function. And in this case, it says, well, there is a method called post on a certain endpoint. And when somebody posts something to that particular endpoint, that will then trigger your Lambda, and it will take the body of the post request as input for my Lambda function. And then it will return something which will we will then be returning to the client. And then the interesting part of this is this whole demo is completely serverless, because if I go to my S3, you can see that there is a, a Loptite app bucket over here, which contains just my static files. And I have just marked this to be uh, hosting a static website. And so I'm serving the static content uh, for this application uh, from a bucket. So it's completely uh, serverless uh, demo too. All right. So this is another scenario uh, where Lambdas can be a really handy tool. Now let's talk about some other use cases. So what people are doing a lot with Lambdas within Amazon, and also you see it with other cloud providers, is they use Lambdas as some sort of glue between other cloud provider services. So whenever, so whenever somebody wants to, let's say, instantiate a new virtual machine inside Amazon, that will trigger a Lambda, which will do some basic setup uh, of the machine before it will launch the machine. Or whenever the machine has started, we'll maybe download something from somewhere and then put it on top of the machine and then make it available. Right? You, so you can use functions as some sort of a glue in between other cloud-provided uh, services. This is a really interesting use case. You can also use it to automate your own CI CD pipeline. Because um, well, vendors like Amazon, they have their own like Git source code repository. So whenever somebody checks something into Git, you can just you know, kick off your CI CD pipeline by kicking off Lambdas, which will then trigger other services to run, maybe spin up like a test environment where you will deploy your software, and Lambdas will then basically orchestrate that CI CD pipeline. So really interesting implementation. It's also cool to play around with bots. Right, so um, uh, voice to speech, text to speech, uh, 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 experimenting with um, uh, bots is something which is really easy to do with the services of most cloud, pro cloud providers these days. And you can have Lambda functions um, uh, backing up the bots. So whenever the bots detect something into a conversation, right, they can send it off to a Lambda function and then do something interesting uh, with it. Right. And then finally, there's voice control. 
which is also um, a really hip and happening right now. So if you have one of these voice assistants in your home, like for example, the Amazon Alexa device, which I brought over here, or if you have like a Google Home or something similar from Microsoft or Apple, then um, it's much more fun to you know, talk to computers instead of just using only the mouse and the keyboard, right? So when I'm just lazy on my couch, I just want to scream something at my Alexa device, and then I want something to happen, right? And this is exactly where both Lambdas and uh, the Home Assistant and voice control uh, comes into play. So with, uh, within Amazon, for example, you're able to create your own Alexa skills that can hook up your Amazon Echo device to Lambdas running in the backend. So we have some really interesting implementation in our Lambda servers over there. And then when our Alexa device um, uh, when you give it a, a command, it will try to interpret that command and then translate that into what we call an intent. And this intent will then be mapped onto one or more Lambda functions. So we can basically trigger our own Lambda functions. So that's exactly what I did. I created a, um, a very simple Hello World application as an Alexa skill uh, in a so-called Hello World speechlet. Uh, we don't have time to show you the entire implementation. Uh, but basically, it resembles an, an, you know, an old-fashioned servlet, right? It has like this on session, on launch, on intent, et, et cetera. So you just implement a bunch of methods, and then you can hook it up to a um, uh, speech command. So let's try it out. So if I enable the device, I can say, Alexa, ask demo to say hi. Hello, everyone at Davox Poland. I hope you are doing okay, and that you like Bert's serverless talk. Have a great conference. All right, so this is how easy it is. Just, this is just basically a simple hello world, but imagine this sitting on your desk, and you just check in some code, and then you say, Alexa, kick off the build, right? That's, that's cool. All right, so my examples so far were mostly hello world, just to show you what's possible, and I'll leave it to your own imagination. But I also, want to talk, uh, I, I also want to talk a little bit beyond Hello World. And one of the uh, really well-documented cases is by Expedia. You probably all know Expedia, right? It's like this you know, search uh, um, uh, thing where you can search for flights, hotels, car rentals, and stuff like that. And what Expedia did is they basically replaced like half a data center with serverless technology. So instead of operating their own data center, they took uh, some of their services uh, convert them into uh, serverless and Lambda implementations. And as you can see from the numbers on this slide, they run quite some computations. So they run about 2.3 billion computations per month, which is a lot. And it comes down to about 200,000 compute hours per month. Now, if you calculate uh, a, 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 a little bit on, on this number, you can figure out that that is about the same as 40 computers running at 100% CPU for an entire month. Right, so no computer runs at 100% CPU, so that basically means they have like hundreds of computers, which they have now replaced each month, right, with Lambda functionality. And the most staggering number on this slide is the one on the bottom. They only pay like 500 and then some dollars per month. So compare this use case with operating like half a data center. That will probably be a little bit more expensive than $500 a month. Right, and this is just uh, one of the examples, and there's many, many more. So if you look at some of the talks from AWS reInvent conferences, then you can find some really interesting use cases from companies um, using Lambdas and some of the other services around this um, uh, with really compelling business cases. And you can find similar business cases for Google Cloud Functions and for Azure Functions as, as well. Now, this presentation would be complete if I were only talking about the pro sides of Lambdas, because there's obviously also... Uh, some showstoppers in there, right? And uh, there's quite a few. Because if you really want to put this out there, then there's stuff that you, need, that you need to think about. And one of the things that you need to think about is whether or not you want to have vendor control and vendor lock-in. Now, if you go back in time, say 40 years or 30 or 20 years maybe, then we had this phrase that said something like, um, uh, nobody gets fired for choosing IBM, right? Which basically meant uh, it was safe to choose IBM, IBM was safe for lock-in. The interesting question is, are the current cloud providers also safe for lock-in? Right? Because they provide tons of really interesting functionality, and we can really stand on, this, on the shoulders of giants if we can leverage that functionality uh, to our own benefit. 
And you know, with lambdas and with some of the other uh, implementations out there, you really can. But it will quickly run into uh, a vendor control and, and lock-in because you will not only write uh, like a simple function in Lambda, but you will integrate with S3 and with DynamoDB and with API Gateway and, and all of the other services. So you will quickly uh, lock into the service of that particular cloud provider. Now, for some of you, this might be a problem. For others, it might just be a huge benefit and a competitive advantage. So this is maybe the most important question uh, that you need to answer. Then there's a bunch of things um, which Lambda or similar technology currently can't do, or which is uh, uh, difficult to do. And uh, there are some concerns, especially security might be a concern. Because by writing everything as Lambda implementations, as functions, we are basically now opening up the attack surface uh, that a hacker can hack into. Of course, Lambdas are not inherently unsafe, right? Uh, you can uh, really lock everything down, but you have to uh, pay attention for each and every function, right? So because hackers can now no longer target these servers underneath, so they will now start to target your application. So you have to make sure that whatever functionality you are providing to the outside world is actually locked down and secure. Then uh, there's other things like the startup latency, which I've already mentioned when I did the first demo. Uh, testing is, 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 uh, is also one because you know, testing a simple function is easy to do, but how do you test like integrating with other functions which are out there in the cloud? And it's really hard to run the entire Amazon cloud on your laptop. Some services they provide mock implementations for, but not for everything. So basically, testing is you know, done in production. And they provide pretty decent support for that. So you can run multiple versions of the same lambdas. You can do A-B testing. You can switch back if something doesn't work. That can even be done automatically. Right? But it's something that we should you know, rethink and that we should take into account. And then there's other things like lambdas are unable to discover other lambdas and how do you manage that like lots of lambdas if all you have is this view with a single column, right? So yes, there's things that we still need to talk about. So I'm not trying to tell you that lambdas are the greatest thing ever, but I think that this kind of technologies and, and this kind of approach to how we do compute in the cloud is essentially changing the way how we deal with the cloud in the near future. And so it is a really interesting tool that, we, that you should start to experiment with, should have in your development toolbox, and maybe not now for you, but maybe uh, sometime in the, in the near future, this really becomes usable for the use cases that you might have. Right? So um, with that, I'm going to go to the really quickly to the, the summary. I think this is interesting technology, the fact that there's multiple talks at all sorts of conferences out there, that all of the major cloud providers are actually on this bandwagon right now, is something... It, uh, well, makes up for that, it, that this is something which is here to stay, right? It is event-based programming, <coughs> infinitely scalable, at least in theory, right? It's completely different from how we are used to deal with applications. And maybe the most important thing, this is really giving the cloud a run for its money again, right? So this is true pay-as-you-go, and you only pay for the stuff that you actually use. So also in a scale-up scenario, if you're a startup, right, then the hardest thing to survive uh, as a startup is a scale-up phase, now, using this kind of technologies, you have the tools in order to survive that skill up phase because you only pay for what you use and you never have to over provision. Right? So, um, lots of bang for the buck. And yes, it's very much proprietary, uh, but um, uh, uh, it, that can be both a good and a bad thing. So, I'm convinced I threw all my computers away, and I hope eventually uh, you do too. So, uh, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be here answering them, and I'll be around for the next couple of days, too.